Okay. This conference will now be recorded. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for being able to join today. Um, I apologize for the cancellation last week. Uh, there was a situation <laughs> that happened on Friday that unfortunately um, required my attention. And so I was unable to join you all. Um, I, it's it's just it's it was a wild week. Um, but okay, so we've got we've got quite a bit to cover today. Um, so let me see if I can get this thing to advance. Okay, yeah. So we're going to be focusing on uh, chapter twenty, which is our research study design, um, as well as why is this showing up? Hmm. Okay, now I went away. Okay, excellent. Um, chapter twenty, which is research study design and quality concepts, and then um, and then chapter sorry, chapter twenty, research study design is chapter sixteen, quality concepts. So as remember, I mentioned last time we're going to be skipping week six, which is use of statistics, control charts, risk adjusted comparisons, all of that good stuff. But primarily chapter thirteen because Danielle is going to be putting together um, a prob a two or three part series on statistics. Uh, because she's literally going to have her whole PhD in epidemiology, so she's going to do an excellent job of really breaking down some of those statistical concepts for us. Um, and that's why we're skipping week six. We're skipping it for now because it's going to be covered later. Um, and then we're on week seven. Okay, so we're going to get started with chapter 20, which is research study designs. So this is, so chapter 20 and chapter 16 have their way of coming up in the test quite a bit. And their expectation is, um, their expectation is that we are going, as an IP, we're going to be um, either conducting research ourselves or reading a lot of research. And so it's important to understand the different study designs that they've implemented, what type of study designs we may be able to use, um, and that when you're evaluating research that you're doing it critically, right? So that you're really taking a look at, um, and that's why the statistics chapter 13 is so important. Um, it contains like a lot of really key information when you're evaluating, oh, well, did they use the right type of statistical analysis? What may be some of the flaws? What may be some of the limitations? Do their methods look okay? Um, and 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 it's essentially to make sure that you have that, that understanding so that when you're evaluating, when you're doing your lit reviews, when you're looking at what the data has to say, you're actually able to um, understand it and explain it to other key leaders at your facility. So this USMLE Step 1 Epidemiology Principles Study Design is a really great video on YouTube um, that is just wonderful at explaining um, the different types of study designs because study designs actually do tend to come up quite a bit in all sorts of different types of certification exams um, and even like your step one for those who are in medical school and so it's it, because it's the same thing right so if you're if you're a physician or if you're you know studying to become a doctor you're expected to stay up to date on what the latest research says so that you're able to you know provide the best absolute care possible to your patients and so you need to know what i'm looking at is this is this significant did they do they do this correctly or you know what are some of the issues and obviously this is why we have to put things through a peer-reviewed process and why when you're writing projects they ask you to do make sure that you're selecting peer-reviewed journals all of that good stuff but it's still important for us to understand it okay so types of epidemiological studies so there's descriptive um, and then we'll we'll see a flow chart really quickly but descriptive is one of them which is a choice of a study design should depend on the populations available for study the frequencies of exposures and outcomes in the population and the available data or participants descriptive studies are our simplest of observational studies um, they include basic quantitative terms such as the number of occurrences of an outcome broken down as a person place and time and these can include case reports and case series as data sources they do not include a control group for comparison and so that's very important to note so oh my why did my slide not advance 
types of epidemiological studies, you've got your analytical here. Um, so as you can see, you've got observational right at the very top. This splits off into your descriptive and your analytic studies. So your analytical studies include these three, cross-sectional, case control, and cohort studies. This is from the APIC module of Infection Control Certification Review course, which is a great course. Um, I highly suggest you know, you're looking into purchasing it um, while you prepare for your certification. But it's important for you to remember these three specifically, your cross-sectional, your case control, and your cohort studies, and that you start finding ways to put them into their own individual buckets and how you're going to figure out, okay, well, the example that they just gave me is X, or the example that they just gave me is Y for this this reason or that reason. Um, you compare individuals with and without an outcome. Um, you're also going to be looking at exposures. There's lots of different, um, lots of different issues that that you can look at with these different types of studies okay so starting with case control studies so you begin with the identification of individuals who have the outcome of interest and this is very important um, so remember you're going to be you're going to be focusing on the outcome of interest you select a control group without the outcome for comparison after case control status is defined, exposures are assessed and evaluated. These are more timely and less expensive than prospective cohort studies, and they're good for studying rare outcomes or outcomes that develop over a long time. Okay, so I always mess up with these drawing tools, but I still have to try. Okay, so important things that you're focusing on, we're beginning with our outcomes. Okay, so you, you got to start with the outcome. This is going to be a really key um, clue. It's a clue when you're when you're trying to figure out how to answer the questions on the test. Um, additionally, you have to remember this. I mean, there's just there's just no way that you you can't not remember this. But they're good for studying rare outcomes, rare outcomes or outcomes that develop over a long period of time. Um, there's a different chart which will break down further. You know, different um, pros and cons, costs, things like that later on. But remember, you're starting with the outcome. OK. OK, so here's our case control example. Remember, again, we always start with our outcome. So in September of 1993, an outbreak of Salmonella enteritidis, phage 4, occurred at a Chinese restaurant in El Paso, Texas. A case control study was conducted to investigate the cause. <laughs> um, cases were confirmed with uh, diarrhea or culture-confirmed Salmonella enteritidis who ate at the restaurant between August 27th and September 15th. Controls were meal companions of the cases without undue effects during the outbreak. The table shows the foods reportedly consumed from the restaurant. So again, controls were meal companions of the cases without undue effects during the outbreak, meaning they did not get sick. So looking at this, you've got your breaded chicken, any chicken, your egg rolls and your fried rice. Which one do you think is um, going to be the one that's associated with the outbreak? And you can write your answer in the chat. Okay, so we've got two answers. Caitlin and Marie are saying it's the egg rolls. <laughs> no, not the egg rolls. <laughs> okay, so this is the this is when you're looking at the full chart where you've got your cases, your controls, your odds ratio um, of cases versus controls, and then your p value. So the majority of our group. Oh, okay, more answers are coming. More, everybody's saying the egg rolls now. Yes, so when you when you start looking, when you actually do the math, when you look at everything, your odds ratio, your highest odds ratio are going to be for the egg rolls. Additionally, now, typically we would have talked about statistics before we did this, but with our p-value, so we know that our p-value is significant if it is below what? A p-value is significant if it's below what?
Yes, good job, Maria. It's 0 0.05. Okay, so <laughs> when you <laughs> when you um <laughs> oh man um when you take a look at your odds ratio and then your p value you can see that it's obviously the egg rolls where we've got you know the highest number of cases the you know our controls those companions who did not get sick and then your odds ratio is quite high and your p value is significant whereas for everyone else it is not okay so cohort studies now cohorts so remember case controls focusing on outcomes focusing on outcomes now we're switching gears cohort studies groups are defined regarding their exposure to a factor of interest okay the presence or absence of a risk factor is determined before the outcome occurs so again we're focusing on exposures um, the goal is to assess whether the incidence of an event is related to a suspected exposure the term cohort describes any designated group of persons who are followed or traced over a period of time. Prospect of cohort studies considered is considered the gold standard because events can be recor recorded as they occur. They're also very expensive. <laughs> and then cohort data reflect the cause and effect temporal sequence of events. So again, you have to start putting things into buckets, right? Put things into buckets. With case controls, we're focusing on outcomes. With cohort studies, we're focusing on exposures. Um, you've got, you know, you obviously got your prospective, your retrospective, um, moving forward in time, moving back in time, et cetera, looking back in time. And so, yes. you've got your oh my slides are moving quite slow it should have already moved the connection must just not be good okay okay well hopefully it'll, it will catch up okay there we go so you've got our timing of cohort your cohort your your your, your exposure status and you're moving forward in time is there you're exposed not exposed is there a good outcome is there a bad outcome and then with your retrospective um you know cohort studies you're again focusing on those exposures going i'm having intermittent audio issues i'm cutting out Ugh, i don't know why i'm doing that i'm sorry i think my connection is just no good today so i apologize Hopefully it will sound okay in the recording. That's all that I can hope for. Um, okay, so we've got our retrospective cohort studies. Okay, so here's another picture of our cohort studies, and this is an example of our prospective. So you've got your source population, the that your investigators selecting your comparison group, your exposed group, and then you're focusing on comparing the incidence of outcomes, right? You're focusing on what's going on, and that's with those with those prospective cohort studies. But again, you have to find whatever helps you in life to remember case controls you're focusing on outcomes core studies you're focusing on exposed non-exposed um, whatever way you're able to remember this just make it work then you've got your cross-sectional studies uh, these are very easy to remember it is my experience that most people like once you start taking questions you once you start um, doing your study questions and your test most people get confused between case control studies and cohort studies. And what's important is if you know that you're having issues with understanding or being able to identify what type of study is being used, you have to just figure out which what it, what is it that I'm confusing? What factors am I confusing? And then go back and try to study those portions. Um, because until you have more clarity on the issue, you're gonna continue to kind of mess things up pick the wrong answer it'll be really muddy in your head um, that's the way that I describe things in my head when they're not you know when they're not organized when things are muddy they're just kind of in a it's a muddy mess in your head so when you're taking a test if you've got different concepts that you have not personally spent time really parsing out really understanding 
you're grasping at straws. Like when you're taking the test, you're like, oh, okay, well, I think, I think it's for that, or I think it's for that. And then you have a hard time remembering. So with cross-sectional studies, um, you're focusing on a snapshot. It's a point in time. And the easiest way for me to always remember cross-sectional studies are point prevalence surveys. When you do a point prevalence survey at a facility, for example, if you do a point prevalence survey for Candida auris or for NDM, or whatever, OXA48, choose your mechanism of resistance. Um, when you do that point prevalence study, you are taking a snapshot of that population of that facility at that point in time. So it's a common observational study design. It provides a snapshot of a population. The assessment of disease and risk factor are performed at a point in time without follow-up. Cross-sectional studies use prevalent cases rather than incident cases right, because you're trying to see the prevalence of what's going on at that moment in time, and are generally used for hypothesis generation. And again, it's that snapshot in time. You can't tell what was going on before. You can't tell what was going on after. It is just on May 16th at 2.16 p.m. X amount of people were on the call. Like there's, well, what about, what about 2.15? Well, it could have been different <laughs> by that time. Okay, so this is a really great chart for you to remember. Case control versus cohort study. So with case control studies, you start with your diseased cases and not disease or your outcome. Again, outcome. They have different ways of explaining it to you or of, or of trying to help you remember. You determine if two groups differ in exposure. It's called a case control due to the way in which the study group is assembled, and it generally yields only estimate of relative risk or an odds ratio. With a cohort study, you're going to start with not the disease, but exposed and not exposed followed up um, to determine difference in rates at which disease develops in relation to that exposure, right? Called so because the use of a quote-unquote cohort, and then it yields incidence rates, relative risk, and attributable risk. Okay, so this is your different types, types of criteria. So cost and time, number of subjects, whether it's suitable for a rare exposure, whether it's suitable for a rare outcome, um, and it talks to you about like cohort case control and cross-sectional. Um, I think that this is a really great chart to go over um, as far as criteria for your cohort versus your case control. So you're suitable for rare exposures. You can see that the cohort is really good for that, but your case control is poor. Now when you're focusing on outcomes, if it's suitable for rare outcomes, your case control is going to be the better choice and your cohort will not. So just take a look at this pause it, take a picture, write it down, whatever you need to do, but it's it's a great way of trying to find um, differences that you need to remember for the test. Okay, so question one. 1,081 community dwelling Japanese individuals aged 60 and older without dementia had data available from a food frequency questionnaire in 1990 to identify dietary intake of potassium and calcium. After 17 years, 305 participants were identified from medical records as having dementia. The investigators reported findings that higher self-reported dietary intakes of potassium and calcium reduce the risk for dementia. So the first thing that we're going to do is frame the research question that likely supported the study. So what were they trying to find out? Frame what you think the research question would be. Okay, so does dietary intake in Japanese people 60 years and older affect the risk of developing dementia later in life? Okay, very similar to what you guys had written down. Okay, number two, what research design was used to conduct this research? It's okay if you're not sure, just write down what you think it, it could be. Okay. 
Okay. So it's a retrospective cohort study, right? So not a, okay. So I not a lot of people are you know putting in what they're what you what you're thinking it is. So I'm I'm unsure if it's because you're not sure of what you're looking at or you know maybe it's a little bit confusing. But we're really we're really trying to understand um, you know what the those exposures right. You're looking back at the data. Right, you're looking back at the data and you're trying to find out whether or not that dietary intake related to potassium and calcium, you know, ends up causing dementia. So again, retrospective cohort study. Okay, Danish investigators undertook a blank study to evaluate the association between breast implants and connective tissue or other rheumatic disease. The study included women who had undergone breast implant surgery from 1964 through 1993 for cosmetic reasons or for reconstruction after breast cancer. Investigators collected data on the occurrence of connective tissue disorders following the implant surgery. Thus, the surgery and all of the outcomes under study had occurred by the time the investigators began the study. So, read through that again and then figure out which type of study they used. Okay. We've got lots of different answers. <laughs> We've got A, B, C. <laughs> Just waiting for somebody to put D. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is going to be a retrospective cohort study. So we're focusing on the exposure, right? The association between breast implants and connective tissue or other rheumatic disease. So what women got the breast implants? You know, who didn't get the breast implants? What are we really focusing on? And obviously it's retrospective because we're focusing on those surgeries that happened from 1964 through 1993. Okay. All right, question number three. Surveys were mailed to every 20th person listed in a local telephone directory. Each person was asked to report age, sex, drinking habits, and breast cancer presence during the preceding week. Nearly 40% of the surveys were completed and returned. About 10% of women reported the presence of breast cancer overall. 15% of heavy drinkers reported breast cancer and 8% of teetotalers reported breast cancer. What research design was likely used to conduct this study? Oh, yeah, okay, everybody's answering on this one. Okay, so this one was pretty easy, right? Cross-sectional study design. And I always tell people, I'm like, listen, once you get cross-sectional, like, it's done. Cross-sectional, you're good to go. Once you understand it, all of the questions regarding cross-sectional studies are gonna make a lot of sense to you. The ones that people continuously struggle with are the case control and the cohort studies. So you just gotta, you know, you just gotta keep reviewing, gotta keep reviewing. And like I said, that USMLE video is actually extremely helpful. Um, however you learn best, whether it's reading or listening or whatever helps you understand, just keep finding those resources. So we're gonna be stating yes or no for each sentence, okay? State whether or not a cohort study is best suited for each of the following scenarios. So cohort study cohort study. So A, when little is known about a rare exposure. Rare exposure.
I was going to say, Jessica. <laughs> That's why I was like, <laughs> okay. Very good. Yes, yes. Okay. When little is known about a rare disease, rare disease. And I remember we were using disease as referring to it as outcomes, right? So no, it's not going to be good. Rare diseases or rare outcomes, we're going to focus on those case control studies. When the study population will be difficult to follow. No. And then when you want to learn about multiple effects of an exposure. Multiple effects of an exposure. That's going to be a yes. OK, very good. OK, question five, indicate whether the following statements are true or false. So you're going to, is what I'm saying true or is what I'm saying false? So A, a retrospective cohort study is more efficient than a prospective cohort study for studying diseases with a long latent and induction period. Okay. True. Okay, next one. B, cohort studies are the most sensible design for examining many exposures in relation to a single disease. That's going to be a no ma'am, no ham. That's a false. Okay, C, the ideal comparison group for a cohort study would consist of exactly the same individuals in the exposed group had they not been exposed. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if you could do that? Oh, these are all twins. But even twins, they're not the same. They'd have to be clones. <laughs> but yes, it's true. So you want to try, you know, you want to try to match them as closely as possible um, because you're obviously trying to compare. So it wouldn't be fair to compare, you know, three-year-olds versus 75 year olds like you you want to make sure that there's and they you know you learn about trying to make sure that your studies are as accurate as possible but this is true the ideal ideal in an ideal world which we do not live in but in an ideal world yes okay so d is loss to follow-up can be a problem in a cohort study but not an experimental study true or false Okay, so guys, this is going to be false. This is going to be false because we are going to run into lots of issues. Lots of issues in all different types of studies. I mean, loss to follow up is, is a huge issue. Um, okay, question six. All right, we got to wrap up this, this section so we can get into patient uh, quality concepts. Okay, question six. Investigators enrolled. 293 Parkinson's disease patients with three years within within three years of their diagnosis. They also enrolled 286 people without Parkinson's disease, matching the patients on age, race, and sex. Assessments of prior exposure to over-the-counter pain pills such as ibuprofen were made in all participants. The investigators found that the regular use of pain pills was markedly lower in persons with Parkinson's disease. What research design was likely used to conduct this study? What are we starting with? What are we starting with? No, we're still getting these wrong. Oh no, that's okay. That's okay. It happens. We have time. You have time. You have time to to work on it. It's okay. It's going to be a case control study, guys. So we're starting we're starting with that outcome, right? You're focusing on that outcome. Parkinson's disease versus 
people without Parkinson's disease. Yes, you can look at, you know, you can assess some of those exposures, but it's it's outcome driven. Parkinson's disease versus without Parkinson's disease. Okay. All right. Well, it's time to get started. We got to switch gears. We got to switch gears and we're starting chapter 16, which is quality concepts. And this is one of my favorite presentations or portion of the presentation because I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Big Harry Potter fan. I'm a Hufflepuff. Feel free to put whatever house you are if you're if you're into Harry Potter. Okay, Gryffindor is Gryffindor is in the house. Slytherin is in the house over here in our office. Um, but oh, we've got more Gryffindors on the call. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, I have to find ways to make the content that I'm learning fun for myself. And so, if you're not a Harry Potter fan, that's fine. Just you know you're along for the ride today um so we've got our we've got our key concepts um oh somebody's 10 year old is reading harry potter now what a time i remember i remember i remember those days when i was reading those books oh my goodness takes me back takes me back okay so Key concepts, healthcare quality and improvement uses interdisciplinary teams to deploy changes and improvements. If there's one thing that I always tell my team members and I say, so much of your success in your role as an infection preventionist relies on the relationships that you have with people within your facility. Um, you have to have good relationships with multiple teams, multiple team members in order to ensure that you are doing what's best for your facility and your patients. Because if you don't have those relationships, people are not going to, you're not going to be that person that they think of when there's an issue or when there's a problem or where something happens. They're not going to think, oh, let me reach out to, you know, loose with infection prevention. They're going to be like, oh, well, who, who do they, who do they know? Do they know risk management more? Do they know uh, patient safety and high reliability more? It's, it's an interdisciplinary team. So you have to remember that we're part of an interdisciplinary team. Infection preventionists have the responsibility of performing continuous quality improvement studies using systematic, sorry, systemic programs and tools and determining outcomes. So you've got this thing called the quality toolbox. And the way that I helped myself remember all of this shenanigans was, not that it's shenanigans, it's actually very important, very important stuff. Um, that's actually on my to-do list. So one of the next certifications that I really want to pursue is either, um, it's probably going to be the CPPS, which is focusing on patient safety, but you've got your quality toolbox. So the way I see it is in Harry Potter, you have lots of different spells. And those different spells are used to achieve different outcomes. So, for example, in this lovely picture, Luna Lovegood is doing a Patronus charm, which is a protective spell. It's a spell that you use to protect you. You've got all other sorts of spells, like Bombarda, which can blow up a door. You've got, you know, um, what else? Lumos, which will, which, well, let's not do that one. That one's crazy. But Lumos, which will, you know, turn a light on or, you know, bring light from your wand. So every single quality um, tool that you see here can help you solve different problems or different issues in your facility. So gap analysis, root cause analysis, failure mode effect analysis, your control charts, your checklist, guiding documents, all of these things will help you address different issues and different problems. Okay, so performance improvement. Performance improvement is an ongoing continuous cycle that focuses on patient clinical outcomes, customer satisfaction, and service. What is an example of a performance improvement model? It's the PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act. It's a constant purpose towards change and it is repeated over and over and over again. This is the most commonly used performance improvement tool in my facility. Um, our nurse practice council, we're always talking about like what PDSA we're working on, what multiple PDSAs are happening throughout all of the different units. Um, so it's important to know like plan, do, study, act. And for a lot of this, it's not just gonna be patient safety and high reliability that are leading the charge in these performance improvements. You have to have input from the bedside and from the front lines because they're the ones who are gonna bring these issues to you, tell you, hey, this keeps happening. Our falls continue to happen primarily during X amount of time and X amount of time. What are some of the things that we can do to reduce them? Let's let's come up with a plan. Like it, it's just continuous, 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 all of the, all of the time. You can always improve. So some of the basic principles. 
when it comes to quality. So in 1996, the Institute of Medicine launched a concerted effort to improve the nation's healthcare quality. So in 1999, you have to err, to err is human, which brought issues of patient safety and medical errors um, to the forefront, where 2% of all deaths are due to preventable medical errors. Um, and then crossing the quality chasm in 2001, which urgently calls for changes to healthcare processes to improve quality of care, sets a framework for healthcare quality improvement, and brings the importance of patient and family centered healthcare to the front line. So these are two very important publications that really guide a lot of those um, patient safety quality uh, process improvement issues. Um, this has actually, you know, patient safety has actually been quite a quite a big topic of discussion within my household, and I'm sure with a lot of other of your households. Um, uh, recently with what happened um, with Redonda Vaught. Um, and so it's, 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 it has brought up a lot of really um, interesting conversations within spe specifically my household because my husband does IT. He he does lit he's cybersecurity like he does stuff with computers and you know he had a, a really difficult time understanding um, you know the the case and just asking questions um, and my brother in law is a patient care tech at the hospital that I'm at and so really talking about um, what that workday looks like what process improvement is like talking about the Swiss cheese model um, really touching base on blame and shame how that should never be promoted you should never be a, a facility that is blaming and shaming people for bringing issues um, or problems mistakes errors up to you because that is the way that you can really improve patient safety right blame and shame only hides things it only it only makes it more difficult for you to have a safer environment for your patients so robust performance improvement programs measure how a facility organization controls or performs root cause analysis, reports individual physician or unit rates, and benchmarks the organization's infection rates against community, state, and national averages, which we are all having to do when we're reporting to NHSN. So the strategic plan. So the strategic plan determines the direction an organization will go in the future and what the organization must do in order to reach the goal. Mission or vision, so a strategic plan steps. One, you've got your analysis of the organization, forming conclusions about what an organization must do as a result of issues uh, facing the organization, and then you've got a lot of action planning that you're gonna do, obviously, with your strategic plan. Uh, performance improvement teams. Multidisciplinary teams are a valuable tool in deploying a quality-focused culture or process. Um, a project team or committee is composed of subject matter experts who do the work. They have to actually be doing the work, right? Um, to, to be able to bring ideas and issues and really talk at depth of, of what, what is going on within your hospital. Um, senior leadership support is key. And this is, uh, this is just so, so extremely important. Um, if you do not have leadership support with the initiatives that you're trying to do when it comes to patient safety or infection prevention, it's going to be very, very difficult to get them off the ground. Um, you have to have that leadership buy-in. They have to understand why it's important, why the work is important. Um, and so, so definitely, please make sure that you have um, that that connection with your senior leadership. So teams prove effective and accomplish work with the support of senior organizational leaders and managers. Senior leadership creates the quality culture and requires team members to report and discuss their valuable learning experience. Okay, so the gap analysis. The way that they're going to ask you questions on the CIC examination about these different types of methods is they may be able to give you examples or it'll be something more general, like which of the following tools um, will take you from a current state to a desired state? And then they'll have root cause analysis, uh, failure mode effect analysis, a strategic plan, and a gap analysis. It could be something as simple as that or it could be more detailed examples you have to know the basics. You have to know the basics and then take it from there. Remember, I always I always tell you guys, it's a process of elimination. When you're doing this test, so much of it is just knowing how they're gonna trick you, the type of questions that they're gonna ask you. Is it black and white? Do I have time to figure this out? Do I not know? So let me do my best educated guess and keep moving. So much of it is just you doing a good job at practicing your test taking skills. Um, so gap analysis. Um, Technique is used to compare best practices with the current processes and determine 
the steps to take to move from a current state to a desired future state. So I always, you know, this is uh, Professor Trelawney. She does divination in Harry Potter, which is like looking into the future using crystal balls, all of that stuff. Um, and so I chose her for this because you're going from your current state and you're trying to um, figure out where you want to be and you're identifying those gaps so that you can, it's a literal gap analysis. What are the gaps? How do we need to fill it? Because this is where we're trying to be. This is where we need to be. So these are the things that we need to correct. So, and um, this is my quote by Hermione where she's like, you know, she's making fun of the whole situation. And she says, use your inner, use your inner eye to see the future. And so whatever helps you remember, hopefully this will help you remember. If it doesn't, this is the best that I got. Okay. <laughs> like, I could, I could try to come up with a Lord of the Rings themed <laughs> patient safety toolbox situation. But let me tell you, this is, this is pretty good for me. Um, so root cause analysis. You have to know about your root cause analysis when it comes to infection prevention um, and patient patient safety. So the root cause analysis takes a retrospective look at adverse outcomes and determines what happened, why it happened, and what an organization can do to prevent the situation from recurring. Um, the information is collected through structured interviews, document reviews, and field observations. And a lot of the times, your root cause analysis, you have to you have to pair this puppy up with the word sentinel event, okay? If they ask you a question, which of the following uh, quality, tool quality tool would you use to address a sentinel event? Boom, it, immediately it, this is what should pop up in your head. So I chose um, Prisoner of Azkaban. If you have not seen the movie, I am so sorry. You are way late to the party. I do not feel bad for spoiling anything. Um, but in this, in this, specifically in this movie, they go back in time and they're trying to figure out how to correct an issue or what were the steps that were taken um, for for you know buckbeak you know buckbeak's execution to happen and how could they have prevented it how could they have stopped it and so um, that's why I chose this movie specifically to represent that root cause analysis. Uh, risk managers and patient safety experts use the root cause analysis widely to investigate major incidents, sentinel events, or errors in healthcare delivery. The root cause analysis, the root cause analysis process avoids individual individual blame. Okay, that's bolded, bolded. It avoids individual blame, considers human factor engineer, human factors engineering, and analyzes redesign for a safer system. Okay, so you've got human and other factors, processes or systems involved, the underlying causes and effect of the process, and risks and potential contributions to failure. Again, blame and shame does not work. It does not improve your processes. It does not lead to a safer environment for your patients. Your staff need to know that when they come to you with an issue, that a mistake a mistake that was made that you're going to, um, you know, respond in a way that's going to ensure that this mistake doesn't happen in the future. What are some limitations of the root cause analysis? The team must delve deep enough into the adverse cause of the problem in order to determine process change. The root cause analysis may be expensive, time consuming, and labor intensive, and team members may require training on the techniques, goals, and outcomes before participating in the root cause analysis. So to remember some of the limitations, um, it can be expensive, time consuming, and labor intensive. Um, so we've got the gold, Harry's gold. Um, and then the other thing is that it is difficult and takes quite a bit of time. And so the other memory or the other movie I chose um, is um, The Half-Blood Prince because they're trying to gain access to this very specific memory. And it took a long time and it was extremely labor intensive and it was very difficult. So um, yes. Whenever you see the words fishbone or Ishikawa diagram, you have to immediately think about your root cause analysis. Just immediately, without any questions. I'm pretty sure one of the questions on one of your practice tests is um, the Ishikawa diagram would be used for, you know, like which of the following. And it was literally like gap analysis, root cause analysis, FMEA, like all of them which one does it go with, root cause analysis. So you start with your problems. So uh, here for this one specifically, we're back again, prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, the problem is serious being unfairly convicted for Wormtail's murder. And so then we're working our way back 
<laughs> um, this would obviously be <laughs> a healthcare issue, but you would have people, process, equipment, management, environment, materials. Um, at the conclusion of the root cause analysis, a team summarizes and identifies causes and begins to strategize about process redesign. The root cause analysis serves as a formal structure to learn from past mistakes. Okay, so the root cause comes in six flavors, or this is, as far as, you know, what what we can tell from a lot of the issues that have happened. The root, the root causes for a lot of issues are going to fall into one or two, either people or your procedures and your standards. So with procedures and standards, you've got no procedure, right? Like, oh, well, <laughs> we had no procedure set in place. We've got poor procedure, something that wasn't really fully fleshed out. Um, a well-written procedure, but it's out of date. Um, Maybe it's very well written, but it's just simply not what's happening out on the floor anymore or in practice. Um, you can you can have these beautiful, beautiful SOPs written out telling you exactly what you're supposed to be doing. But if they're not being followed, um, you know, what can you do? And then your people. So are the people poorly trained? Did they receive no training? Um, where people train but chose not to follow the procedure. So after training, follow-up needs to be done to reinforce the information and ensure that employees are following proper procedures. This is really important when you when you have ICARs or when you conduct ICARs, infection control assessments, um, they really focus a lot, a lot on competency, like competency validation. You can do a training, but are you truly competent? Like, are you validated that you've understood what you've been taught. So competency validation is a really big deal. Um, your failure, failure, failure mode effect analysis, so the FMEA is a tool that is proactive. It has a preventative approach to identify potential opportunities for error. So this is great because this is going to actually help you identify potential problems before they occur. This is important and it's a really key thing to helping you make sure that you select this one um, as your answers when they're talking about prevention, we're preventing something. We're trying to prevent an issue, um, a problem. We're doing we're doing our FMEA. So this is all happening before. So when you've got those questions that are phrasing, which of the tools would you use in order to um, prevent an event from occurring, or et cetera, you should immediately be thinking, oh, okay, well, it's not going to be a root cause analysis because that's once the sentinel event has already occurred, it's not going to be, you know, a gap analysis. It's going to be an FMEA. Uh, the SWOT analysis, so this one, oh, okay, my thing is, there we go, the SWOT analysis, which is the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities threat analysis. Um, it's utilized to investigate public health issues and improve healthcare outcomes. Conducting this type of analysis points out what the organization should plan for and how to use resources and guide efforts within a formal uh, framework. Um, and this is, you know, this is an example of, you know, Slytherin strengths, they're ambitious, um, they've got a strong network of evil wizards, <laughs> you know, if that's what you're looking for. Um, weaknesses, bullying, opportunities, um, perfect recruitment pool for death eaters, right? And then you've got your threats. Um, so this is, this is a funny way of remembering or, or of thinking about your SWOT analysis, but when you actually use a SWOT analysis, um, we had to use this when we were trying to address antimicrobial resistance in Orange County. What were our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, um, and threats within the county to really, to really deal with some of the antimicrobial resistance that we were seeing? And when I was working at the health department, what actually came out of our SWOT analysis were these different work groups. And one of them was specifically focusing on developing an, a countywide antibiogram. And this antibiogram actually ended up coming to fruition and we were able to present it at, um, at um, the NATO National, National Conference that happened in Orlando a couple of years ago. But, it, you know, it, these things, these different types of tools can really lead to some really great outcomes. Um, so you have to understand where you might be able to use them to improve um, your your facility or even like public health, like your your county issues. I mean, what we ended up finding out when we did the county antibiogram was that 
a lot of our facilities shared very similar resistance patterns. And it ended up being extremely helpful because obviously our local, um, you know, just like your PCPs, they're, it's not like a hospital where they get an annual antibiogram sent out to them. This is what the facility is seeing. And so when we, we were able to collaborate, you know, there was legal was involved. We had to get disclosures, like all of this stuff signed um, and and put all of it together into a massive antibiogram. But it was it was a great thing. So lots of lots of really good things can come out of this. Okay, multi-voting multi -voting is the process of prioritizing a large list of topics to a final selection for performance improvement. So team members vote, rank their selection in order of priority, and after votes are tallied, they decide on which project they will work on. Multi-voting can occur multiple times to narrow the possibilities even further. So you've got your big, your big pile, and then you break it up into a smaller piece. You vote again, a smaller piece, until you really narrow it down to know, I think that this is what we really need to focus on. Um, as a facility. And then you've got your goal-directed checklists. So checklists have been used in aviation for more than 60 years. Aviation uses checklists to ensure pilots complete the most basic steps, securing capacity for complex cognitive action. And then by applying checklists to the prevention of infection within an organization and using simple steps, such as washing your hands and cleaning the skin with antiseptic, organizations can eliminate hazards and problems that affect patients every day. Now here's the issue with checklists. You actually have to use them right if it just becomes another thing for your for your staff to like just click check all the boxes as they go down it defeats the purpose right because then it's taking away that that action of actually checking to ensure you're doing the right thing okay so we've got some run charts so run charts are used to identify how processes change over time run charts allow for the mean or average to be determined and show changes in the mean and average uh, run charts are also they also demonstrate special cause variation when there is a steady pattern of observation uh, points failing above or below the mean or average line in an equal pattern with your affinity diagrams you're gathering large amount of language data and creatively um, grouping the data based on lines of natural relationships so data are used collected from brainstorming our customer service and then you split them up so with here you can tell we've got all of our ideas and then they're being split into either quality service delivery or price pareto charts pareto charts are amazing Oh, Pareto charts is just the bomb. Okay, they're my favorite. So Pareto charts, they're a series of vertical charts arranged and sorted in descending order of height from left to right with a cumulative percentage line on the y-axis. Pareto charts will allow a team to identify where their efforts will produce the greatest value, implying that 80% of the benefits will stem from 20% of the causes. So your Pareto charts are actually extremely, extremely important. So when you're focusing on, on the example that's being shown here, so you're focusing on your types of medication errors, and you can see that you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck if you focus on the doses being missed, the wrong time of administration, the wrong drug, um, and then the overdose. That's what you want to be focusing on, like education, awareness, because that's what's going to have, that's what's going to bring you the greatest amount of benefits. Okay, so concept check. Um, a line graph shows how long an issue has existed. Is this true or false? A line graph shows how long an issue has existed. Okay, very good for those of you who put A. The Pareto chart is used to prioritize opportunities for improvement. The Pareto chart is used to prioritize opportunities for improvement. Yes, very good for those of you, but true. Pareto charts can be used to show many different views of given data sets. True or false? This is for number three. Pareto charts can be used to show many different views of a given data set. Okay, that's true. For Pareto analysis, data should be collected for analysis considering which of the following. Who, why, where, what, and when. So this one's a little bit more difficult, but you're going to focus on who, where, and what, and when. Not necessarily why, but A, C, D, and E. Okay, concept check. Match the letters with the graph or chart. So 
with A, which one's going to tell you which one's a significant problem? So A, significant problem, line graph or Pareto chart? Significant problem. Good. B, a trend, a trend. A trend. Trend over time. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a line graph. Okay. C, a cumulative percentage. Cumulative percentage. The Pareto chart. Okay. D is a gap. Very good. And then your 80 20 rule is going to be your Pareto chart. Okay, good. Okay, Six Sigma and the Lean Approach. Um, you're going to be, so Six Sigma and the Lean Approach is, is included. It's concentrating on precision and accuracy that leads to defect-free products or services. Um, strategies are utilized value stream mapping, transactional mapping, just-in-time training. Uh, Six Sigma and Lean Principles use the DMAIC format, which creates a data-driven quality strategy for improving processes. Um, and so you're essentially, you're trying to minimize the variance, right? So in the beginning, you've got a lot of variance, right? When you're looking at the, the earlier portion of the chart, you've got these really high peaks and really low peaks, and there's so much, so much, so much, so much variance. Um, and so you're trying to really narrow it down. Uh, Jessica said, we're eliminating waste. Yes, you're really trying to narrow it down so that you don't have as much variance in your data. Um, okay, so what is Lean Six Sigma? We don't have enough time to go into all of it. Um, the Plan, Do, Study Act. Uh, this is a great video. Uh, what is Lean Six Sigma? Introduction to Lean Six, Six Sigma, and the link is right there. Um, the Plan, Do, Study Act performance improvement model, Plan, Do, Study Act, so the PDSA cycle. Uh, improvement and change is a cyclical activity. So plan is going to be identifying responsibilities for the, for, for the program, process mapping, or that gap analysis. The do is the plan that is executed, strategies are implemented, examples, conducting surveillance activities, performing um, staff and patient education, ensuring adherence to evidence-based guidelines, developing various methods of effective communication. The study is going to be the analysis of those actions, developing pilot programs and conducting strategic planning activities. Um, root cause analysis or failure mode effect analysis may be utilized to systematically identify process failures and prioritize change. Data display, benchmarking, and trending are really essential. And then ACK, instituting strategies and measuring the effect of the action on the project. And then you just do that all over and over and over again. Okay, so some of our conclusions. Performance improvement is an ongoing continuous cycle that focuses on patient clinical outcomes and customer satisfaction and service. Uh, measuring performance determines program effectiveness and efficiency and determines whether proactive approaches or retrospective analysis of high-risk processes can further improve the infection prevention and control program. Okay, I'm gonna try to go through some questions super, super quickly um, because it is the end, but question one, which of the following refers to patient harm that is the result of treatment by the healthcare system rather than from the health condition of the patient? Correct, Jeffrey, it is a adverse event. Question two, the Director of Infection Prevention and Control is leading a process improvement project to decrease the rates of collapses in one of the hospital ICUs. The multidisciplinary team has discussed multiple process improvement strategies to decrease these bloodstream infections. In developing the final improvement plan, which of the choices below is most likely to help decrease the rates of these infections? A, performing a gap analysis each month, B, performing a failure mode effect analysis immediately. C, incorporating the use of a CLABSI bundle and a checklist to ensure that all aspects of the plan are followed. Or D, perform a SWOT analysis. Very good. A lot of you put C. Good, good, good. All right. In 1997, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations mandated the use of the root cause analysis too. 
A, document instances of medical malpractice, B, predict the occurrence of an incident, C, improve staffing issues, or D, investigate sentinel events in accredited hospitals. Remember, remember I told you this one. I said, it's gonna be a question. <laughs> because somehow it always pops up. It's just, they, they always ask about root cause analysis and sentinel events. Question four, the purpose of root cause analysis is to determine A, determine which individual made an error so that the employee may be disciplined or terminated. Uh, B, review the basic processes that are in place and then turn that review over to a unit specific team so they can determine how they should modify their practices. C, provide a process that requires little time or training but allows employees to identify culpability after an adverse event or D, include participants from diverse areas of the organization to delve into the cause of an error or systems failure and identify changes in practice and or policy that will prevent a repeat of that error. D is correct. Okay, this will be the last one. So after reviewing the quarterly report, the manager of the adult ICU contacts the IP for assistance to create a plan to reduce central line infections. Which of the following should the IP recommend? A, wait for next report to see if the rate has decreased. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> B, create an intravascular team. C, develop a multidisciplinary team to review and implement best practices. Or D, send a referral to medical affairs for peer review. Very good. Could you imagine? Oh, hey, infection prevention. We're having a really big issue with collapses. Well, why don't you just wait another quarter and see if the problem has fixed itself? <laughs> wait for the next report to see if the rate has decreased. I cannot. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to develop a multidisciplinary team to review and implement best practices. Okay. So, I lost my mouse. Um, but that's it for today. So if you guys have any, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat, but I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Record, stop recording.